good morning. Morning, it's great to see you today. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name's Craig and I'm part of the team here. And it's my joy to, to share from God's word this morning. But we're in the middle of a series called In This House, where we're unpacking some of the, the core culture, some of the core values that we share together as a church family. You know, last week, um, Carl talked about we uh, connect with family. Actually, when we, when we gather together, it's easy to think about church as just something that we attend, isn't it? It's a show, it's a service that we attend. But actually, that's not what church is. Church is a family that we're called to be part of. The Bible talks about the church as a body, that each part of the body has a part to play. And actually, as we gather together, it's not just something that we do out of habit. It's not just a show that we attend, but actually it's a family that we're part of. And our heart is that every single one of us here would be part of God's family in church, would, would be dependent on each other, would be looking out for each other, and we would be family together. And that's something that we don't always get right, is it? You know, Carl said actually sometimes that, that kind of pain is around that because we're all imperfect people trying to be family together. But actually that shouldn't stop us from striving to be family from striving to care for one another. And so today I'm going to talk about our second value, which is growing in God. Actually, as a church, we believe that for each of us individually, it's so important that we grow deeper and deeper in God. And also as a whole church, we want to grow to know God deeper, don't we? We want to grow deeper in him. So I want to encourage you, would you join me um, in reading from Hebrews chapter 5? I'm going to give you a second to turn there, to to flick your, your phones on. If you're new to this whole church thing, kind of this is part of the New Testament. So this is all the stuff that came after Jesus. So Jesus, at this point, he's, he's died, he's, he's risen again, he's gone to heaven. And um, this is a letter that's written by, well, we're not actually, people debate who this is written by, so we're not actually entirely sure which human person wrote this. But this is written to a group of believers who are from a Jewish background. So they've kind of been around the block a little bit. They're not new believers, they've kind of been doing this for a bit. But they're facing extreme persecution. Right, the, 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 the setting they find themselves in is that, that there's kind of being a Christian isn't just a nice thing that you say. Actually, it comes with real consequences for your life. For the people of Hebrews, you know, it's not just a, a wishy-washy thing to say. But saying you're a Christian, saying you're a follower of Jesus can actually mean that you might lose your, your, your welfare, your family might shun you, your community might reject you. So actually, this is a really deep time they find themselves in. But so if you're there, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to 14 says this, we have so much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's a bit of a challenging passage, isn't it? The writer here, I think the writer here has been a little bit tongue in cheek because they then go on to kind of bring some of that deeper truth. But they're making a really good point here, aren't they? If you think about your growth inhumanly, kind of when you're a baby, you need milk, don't you? But as you grow, there's an expectation that you mature. And actually, he's challenging these believers here. He's saying, you've been believers for a while. You're not new to this. You've been following Jesus for a while, but yet you're still stuck on those basic truths. You're still stuck on a a really rudimentary understanding of Jesus, and you need to go deeper. It's time to grow up a bit. (laughs) It's time to mature. See, our, our belief here is that for each and every one of us, we should grow in God. For every single one of you, no matter whether you're really new to this church thing, you're really new to faith in Jesus, or whether you've been a follower of Jesus for 60 years. Actually, there is more for us. There is deeper we can grow in God. Actually, you're, it's, we're not called to be static. We're called to keep growing in Jesus. Actually, if you're new to this whole thing, then actually those elementary truths, that's where you're at, and that's amazing. You need to kind of take that. You need to take that spiritual milk. But if you're a bit more mature, you've been following Jesus longer, actually there's a challenge here that says you need to go deeper. You need to keep going deeper because I believe that, that being static, being placid is a killer of faith. It's a killer of belief. You know, the, the, the whole book of Hebrews is the writer writing to them partly because the writer's concerned they're going to walk away from the faith. You know, they're facing real challenge. They're facing persecution. It's not easy being a Christian. 
And the writer's concerned. The writer says this, if you don't grow, you're going to walk away from your faith. You see, I believe for us, if you have a faith that's static, that doesn't grow, it quickly becomes boring. Has anyone else experienced that? Like, let's be honest, I think I've been there at points in my life that when I take the foot off the gas and I stop growing, when I just stay where I am and go, well, you know what? I'm happy where I am. This is nice. This is good. Very quickly, it becomes very, very boring. And do you know what? Following Jesus isn't meant to be boring. It's meant to be exciting. It's meant to be challenging. And actually, there's this truth here that this writer is trying to get across is that each of us are called to grow in God. And if you don't grow in God, and we've seen it time and time again, if you stop growing, the chances are that your faith will quickly become boring and irrelevant in your life. And very quickly, other things begin to fill that space. And very quickly, before you even realize it, often it's not intentional, but before you even realize it, it's become a very secondary thing in your life. And you find yourself wandering away from Jesus. So this is what I'm going to unpack a bit today. I believe that each and every one of us is called to, to grow in God's. Whatever stage we're at, whether we're new to this and we're kind of just trying to figure it all out, whether actually you've not even decided to follow Jesus yet and you're just trying to understand a little bit more, well, that's amazing. Time to grow in it. But also, I, I'm just going to kind of warn you now. I think if, you, if you're here and you've been a Christian a while and your, your faith has been a bit static, I might provoke you a little bit today. I might challenge you. Because actually, I believe that, that when we let faith get static, very easily it becomes boring and then it becomes irrelevant. And I don't want that for your life. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack a few lies, I think, that we tell, us, tell ourselves about growing in God. Now, when you see them on screen, you won't be like, this is a lie that I kind of believe on paper. But when you look at our lives, there might be lies that you see, actually, even though we don't necessarily believe it in our heads, we demonstrate them with, with how we live. But before I get there, I just want to just want to say for the record that actually growing in God is not an optional extra. You know, we often think about, yeah, I can kind of tick the box. I can get my ticket to heaven. I can accept God's forgiveness, which is nothing about me. And you're right. God's forgiveness is all about what Jesus did, not about what you did. But actually the call to each and every one of us is to follow Jesus. It's a call to discipleship. It's a call to grow. I don't, I don't believe it's, it's an optional extra. This is what the call is of Jesus. This is what he's freed us into. He's freed us into an active, growing relationship with him. But are you ready for me to kind of unpack some kind of lies I think we tell ourselves about what growth is? So number one is growth is someone else's responsibility. My growth in God is someone else's responsibility. Actually, do you know what? This morning, I was in a bit of a rush and I forgot to have breakfast. I know. I had a cup of tea, but I didn't have breakfast. So actually, Charlotte, have you got, can you kind of, have you got some breakfast for me? Is that all right? I'm kind of getting, I'm a bit hungry. Let me just, one second. <laughs> ah, that's much better. Now, now we're ready to carry on. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Anyone else find that a little bit weird? You didn't expect that this morning when you came to church. If I'm honest, it's actually quite nice, so I, kind of might, I, might, I might crack on. But that was weird, wasn't it? And why was it weird? Because I'm 27 years old. It's weird for me not to sort my own food out, but to go to someone else looking for my food. It's weird. But then how come so many of us don't feed ourselves, but we come to church on Sunday morning expecting that to be the only thing that feeds us? Yeah, how many of us complain that we're not growing? We complain that maybe the sermon's not deep enough, and I'm sorry if it's not deep enough today. <laughs> but we complain that it's not deep enough, and we're not going deep. Maybe even we move church, because we go, do you know what? The worship's not deep enough here. Do you know what I mean? It's not spontaneous enough for me. It's not bringing me close enough to Jesus. Maybe we go somewhere and we go, oh, do you know what? I'm not... The person, the pastor's not unpacking the Bible enough, so I can't... I, how can I possibly know Jesus more? But what we're doing there is we're going, you've got all the tools to grow deeper in God, but yet you go, well, someone else isn't feeding me. But, you know, there's a point when we're new to this whole faith thing, it's right. Someone else should be feeding you. Someone else should be discipling you. And actually, there's, if you're new to this whole thing here, there's no shame in you not being sure how to kind of go a bit deeper, because actually that's what we're here to help you for. And what I'm not saying here is that as pastors, as leaders, as connect group leaders, we don't have a responsibility to try and pour into you, because we do. It's part of the role, it's part of the gifting as being a teacher. But actually, 
there's a point where we need to mature a bit. We need to put down the bottle. We need to stop relying on someone else to feed you, to grow you in God's. And actually, you need to take some responsibility yourself for it. Because actually, you have been called. You have all the tools to grow in God's. You have those tools. It's your responsibility. I can't make you grow in God's. You need to take responsibility for it. I would, I would love to. If I could make you grow in God, I would love to do that. But I can't. You know, I can't. There's, there's got to be a point where we have to move away from the bottle and we have to go towards the stake, which is a good trade, in my opinion, anyway. But there's got to be a point where we move on and we take responsibility for our own growth. And, and, I, and maybe some of that resonated with you, that actually you kind of, you've, maybe you've even said that before, going, actually, you know what, someone, I wish somebody, even just, let's just take, for example, knowing the Bible more, I wish somebody would preach a bit deeper and, and help me understand the Bible more. Why don't you read it yourself? <laughs> Why don't you actually, and I would say even more so, in the 21st century, there is a million people who can unpack the Bible for you. There is no shortage of resources, is there? You go on YouTube, go and look at the Bible projects on YouTube, go and listen to their podcast. I think they're great. There's loads of people out there who, who can help you. Actually, sometimes we need to take responsibility for our own grief in Jesus, don't we? You need to take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. But number two, the second lie we can sometimes tell ourselves is that growth is a solo journey. We can tell ourselves, and this is in some ways is almost slightly the reverse. We can tell ourselves that growing in God is something that I do completely by myself without anybody to help me. But actually, I believe that growing in God is both something that we, we do in community. We receive in community and we also give in community as well. You know, Carl talked about it last week. We're part of a body. We're part of a family. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. How can we spur one another on? We're meant to encourage each other. How many of you know that it's not easy being a Christian always? How many of you know that actually, even if we take responsibility ourselves, sometimes our kind of growth, our enthusiasm goes up and down, doesn't it? It wanes sometimes. That's when it comes that we do this in community. We encourage one another. That's why we have connect groups, because we believe it's so important that we can't just do this once a week on a Sunday morning. We need to connect in a connect group. We need to get around people to help encourage one another. You see, this isn't something you can do solo. Actually, when, when Jesus kind of commissioned his church, it wasn't all about the individual. We live in a culture, don't we, that's kind of all about the individual. But actually, it's about the community. It's about us as a body. How do we grow together in God? Is this something that we do together? We each take individual responsibility, but also we grow together. But also, from the, from the passage from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it says this, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. I think there's something here, isn't it? I think that actually sometimes your lack of growth robs other people. Your lack of growth costs other people the influence, your influence in their life. Because actually, part of being a disciple of Jesus is that you disciple other people. Part of being a follower of Jesus is that you input into other people. And again, I don't think this is an optional extra. I believe that Jesus called us to be disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and it keeps going on and on and on. And lots of disciples are made. That's the plan. But often there becomes this blockage here because we, we grow to an extent ourselves, but then we go, okay, it becomes all about what we, what we can know, what we can grow, and we don't pour out into other people. And then this creates a blockage in God's plan that there'd be disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. You see, when you fail to grow, it's not just yourself. It's not just more of God that you're missing out on for yourself. It's actually what you can pour out into other people that you're missing out on as well. So when you fail to take responsibility, it costs other people as well. It's not just, this isn't just all about you. This is about us all growing together in God's. But when you don't grow, there's influence you could have. And other people, see the passage that said that these people, the, the writers writing to, should have been teachers. At this point, they should have had the, uh, the basic things so down that they could teach other people. Actually, the writer wouldn't need to be the person teaching. 
they could go and teach new people because these, these are the people they were writing to should have been the ones teaching. But they weren't because they'd taken their foot off the gas. Actually, part of being a follower of Jesus is that we grow in God. And as a result, as we grow deeper and deeper in God, we have more and more to give. We have more and more to help. You can't take people places you haven't been yourself. And so as we go deeper and deeper into God, you can take people deeper and deeper. As you grow, you can take people further on in their growth. You know, I was, um, remember when I was, when I was training as a, as a youth pastor, um, I went to this training event. And one thing that really stuck out to me was they said, but when we, when we look to disciple people, we're not um, travel agents, we're tour guides. And what does that mean by that? I remember, it took me a second because I'm slow. But we're, we're travel agents, not tour, we're, we're tour guides, not travel agents. What does a travel agent do? They sit at a desk and they, they help you. They plan a holiday for you. They tell you of an amazing place to go. But the chances are they've never been there themselves. So they might have it on good authority. They're telling you it's great, but they can't go. They might be able to Google something, but they can't say, oh, do you know what? At that, at that cafe down the road, there's a really nice smoothie. You know, they do a mango smoothie that's beautiful, and you should, like, if you're going to go there, you need to go and get that smoothie. They can't do that, can they? Because they've never been. But a tour guide has been there time and time again. A tour guide knows the lay of the land, and so when they tell you something, when they try and help you, they do it in good authority, don't they? So actually, when we grow in God, it enables us to be tour guides. It enables, enables us to help other people go where we have been before. As Carl said last week, the church is a body, and the body needs all its body parts to function. And as a result, we need to grow in God. So actually, growing in God is not a solo journey. It's not. Right, number three. Growing in God is only is all about spiritual disciplines. Growing in God is all about spiritual disciplines. Now, what I'm not saying here is that spiritual disciplines aren't good. And what do I mean by spiritual disciplines? I mean reading your Bible, praying, fasting, spending time in silence. You know, all those things that when you think about, okay, what does it mean to be a better Christian? <laughs> all those things that you say then, the spiritual disciplines, that's what they are. And actually, spiritual disciplines, before I unpack why, it, why growth isn't all about spiritual disciplines, what I would say is spiritual disciplines are one of the best ways you can grow in God's. So that's not what I'm saying. Actually, if you're a new Christian, the best place you can start is the spiritual disciplines, is reading your Bible, praying, trying to understand it, asking other people. This is, that is the best way to grow in God's. So I'm not saying it's not the best way to grow in God's. And actually, if you want to get better at the spiritual disciplines, if you want to grow in God's, I'm going to give you a really quick three Ps because, you know, I've, I've been trained as a preacher and that's what you're meant to do. And I've got four points today, not three. So I have to get the kind of alliteration in somewhere else. Right. So we've got, we've got, we've got three Ps of, of how to help you. Firstly, get a plan. Actually, life's busy. It's, it's not kind of always, it's not always easy. And, and, and what you'll find is if you don't have a plan for something, it falls to the wayside, doesn't it? So get a plan. Number two, get people. Get people around you to help. I've already said this, but actually, when, when you start reading the Bible, I, it, particularly if you're new to it, but even when you're not new to it, I, I still find this, and I've done a degree in it, is it's confusing. Some of it doesn't make sense. And the whole point of the Bible is that we're meant to, in community, as we reflect on it, as we keep read it, as we keep reading it, as we read it again, as we read it one more time, as we keep reading it, it begin, certain elements begin to make more and more sense. Certain elements begin to kind of feed into each other. But we do that in community. We help each other out. Come and speak to one of us, but actually don't even speak to one of us. If we do the other parts where I said you grow in God and we will grow, then you shouldn't need to come to me. You should be able to come to all the people. Look around you. Ask the person next to you. We, will, you know, we get people. And then number three, get persistent. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to feel like it all the time. I'm just going to put it out there. But you need to be persistent. And the more you get persistent, the more you'll find that it becomes routine. It becomes habit. And you'll find that these things really nourish your life. And they will help you grow in God. Because as I said, these are the, the, probably the best way you can grow in God is by these spiritual disciplines. But what I didn't want to do today is do a talk you've probably mostly heard before, which just tells you to read the Bible more. Because I think you know that. And I think we can, we can put that into practice. But what do I mean when I say that um, what do I mean when I say that spiritual growth isn't all about um, spiritual disciplines? Well, it's, it, let me give you an example. So I think 
throughout history, there have been times where the church have been really amazing at reading the Bible. They've had real discipline. They've kind of spent time reading the Bible. There's been times, you know, just the same time period where the church would pray together. They'd go really deep in prayer. And then at the same time, be incredibly racist or be incredibly sexist or allow major injustices to happen around them. I even read about a, a, ch a church once, and I, I'm, I, I'm not things like simple, but th th they, would, they would meet every Sunday and they would start singing when the trains carrying people to Auschwitz would go past. They would sing because they didn't want to hear it. So they were going deeper in prayer and in worship, but I think, I think growing in God's, I think there was some growth that was needed there, wasn't there? You see, spiritual disciplines are, the, are one of the best ways to grow in God, but actually, a sign that you've grown in God isn't that you're really good at reading the Bible. It isn't necessarily that you're really good at praying. The sign that you've grown in God is that you look more and more like Jesus. The sign that you've grown in God is that actually your attitudes that are unhealthy are challenged. Actually, a sign that you've grown in God is that you recognize in your workplace some of the racism that's even in the systems. It begins to offend you and you want to do something about it. That's the sign that you've grown in God. It's the sign as a church that we grow in God when we, we stop accepting some of those things. And we probably need to grow in that a bit as well. You know, actually, when we grow in God, isn't all about just reading your Bible more. That will help you grow in God. But the end result is that we should be more like Jesus. And even as I was preparing this, I was challenged is that, I, you know, I love reading the Bible. I love, I love theology. But if I get really into that, if I, if I love theology, if I understand Hebrew words more, but yet I don't love my neighbor better, but yet I hear someone say something that puts down women and I don't say anything about it, then I need to grow in God a bit more. And, that, and, that, and that's the challenge. That's the challenge. But if we're going to grow in God more, it's not all about the spiritual disciplines. That will help you grow in God, so don't get me wrong. You need to do the spiritual disciplines. I need to get better at them. But the sign that you've grown in God is that you're more like Jesus, is that the things that offend Jesus offend you. It's that the, the character of Jesus is more demonstrated in your life. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those things will be more evidence in your life as you grow in God. That's the aim. That's the goal. The spiritual disciplines help us get to the goal, but they themselves are not the goal. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I, I kind of want to... I just want to pause there for a moment and just reflect on that because I think too often the church has been... And this is the church generally. I'm not even necessarily speaking about as locally. The church has been so focused about spiritual disciplines as a sign and has allowed great social injustices to happen and has not been bothered about it, and it's not done anything. And it's not okay. We need, when we grow in God, those things need to bother us, need to challenge us. And we're still not completely there. There's still areas we can work, there's still areas where we can get better at that. But so yeah, the, the, the line number three was that growing in God is all about spiritual disciplines. And number four, growing in God will be easy. Growing in God will be easy. Growth hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Does anyone remember being a teenager and when you would get a growth spurt? So I, I was one of those people where I was basically this height from when I was like 14, 15. Right, so I grew early and then all my friends overtook me. But I grew really early and I tell you what, for a couple of years it was painful. Does anyone else remember that? It was painful because actually growing, and when we grow quickly, it can hurt sometimes. Actually, every as, as far as Jesus, what we're called to pick up our cross and follow him. And now, you might not have realized this, but picking up your cross isn't necessarily a really nice thing. <laughs> we're called to sacrifice. We're called to follow him. Actually, the call to follow Jesus, it isn't meant to be easy. In fact, Jesus promises that in this life, you will have trouble. Uh, if you follow Jesus and if you do it right, it's not going to be easy. It's going to hurt. And if you want to become more like Jesus, well, when you read Jesus' life, there's some really amazing things. He goes around, he heals people. He has great influence, but also he dies on a cross. He suffers. He has no kind of fixed home. He has no earthly wealth. Actually, if you pick up your cross, if you try and become more like Jesus, it's going to hurt. And I, I wonder if, feel free to turn with me if you like to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I'll give you a second. Mark chapter 10.
So yeah, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him, which is really awesome, isn't it? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lacked, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what I don't think this is a passage is about, I don't think it's about bashing the people who've, people who've got money. I don't think it's about saying that all of us should be living in poverty, all of us should be poor, and we should have no earthly possessions. However, what I do think it's about is that here we see a rich young man who wants to know God, right? He wants to grow in God. He wants to know the, the kind of the key to the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus realizes that there's this thing in his life that's a blockage. Actually, his comfort in his wealth is a thing that will stop him growing deeper in God. And actually, if he, needs, if he wants to grow deeper in God, he's going to need to make some serious life changes. If he wants to know, grow deeper in God, he's going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable he's going to have to kind of give away his possessions because that will then remove this blockage this thing that's stopping growing deeper in God and again the point of this passage isn't that you need to give away every single thing that you have that you need to sell your house and give every single penny away but what I think the point is in terms of the context we're in now if you want to grow in God if you found that you've become a little bit stagnant then maybe there's something that needs to radically change Maybe there's something in your life that you need to get shaken up a bit. Maybe you need to kind of do something radically different to grow in God. Now, this isn't even necessarily for those of you who are kind of new to this faith thing. I'm sure as you're doing that, there will be things that God points out that you need to change. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. But actually, I really felt as I was preparing this, a kind of burden on my heart for people who've been Christian for a while. Maybe even you've been a follower of Jesus since you, maybe even you grew up in church or you, you kind of, you've been doing this journey for a while, but you've found that you've become stagnant. Actually, and even now, as I've begun saying this, you've kind of, the thought in your head has been like, oh, I kind of know what it is already, but I don't want to change it <laughs> because I'm comfortable. But I believe if you all want to be serious about growing in God, maybe for some of us, we're going to need to do something radical. We're going to need to do something different because following Jesus wasn't meant to be easy. Following Jesus wasn't meant to be this really comfortable thing that we, that we play at for our lives and then go to heaven. No. It's meant to be a challenging, exciting, passionate pursuit of Jesus for our whole lives here on earth to then spend eternity with him as we're raised to life with him. And actually, I wonder whether maybe there's a few people here that there might be a little nudge that you might need to change something up. Maybe it is your possessions and your money. Maybe that has become something that you've become so focused on, building wealth, building, building a kind of a life for you, your family, and, and bringing security financially that you've neglected the things of God. Maybe it's relationships that you've kind of put ahead of, of, of honoring Jesus and, and maybe something needs to change there. Maybe it's kind of, Maybe there's this, you've been p pursuing kind of a career yourself that, that's in itself not bad, but the whole thing's become about progressing in that career and not about what Jesus looks like in the midst of that. I wonder whether for some of us, we might need to do something radically different to follow Jesus. Because actually following Jesus, it, uh, growing in God is not someone else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Actually growing in God is something that's not meant to be easy. It's going to hurt. 
But actually, ultimately, we believe that that's the call that he's placed in each one of us. And we trust God. We know that he has the best for us. We know that in Jesus, we see the perfect example of a human, what it meant to live and walk on this earth without sin. And so if we want to be all that God intended us to be, we need to become more and more like Jesus. And sometimes that might hurt a little bit. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. And, and I, just in response, I've got a few things I want to challenge you to, but actually I, I kind of feel a lot of the response to this isn't something that you can do right now. A lot of the response to this is going to be something that you need to put into place as you leave this place. Maybe it's those three Ps, get, get a plan. Maybe you need to have a plan about your spiritual growth. You've been, maybe you've been lax about when it comes to reading your Bible and praying, that you've just done it when you felt like it, and maybe you need to get serious about going deeper in those spiritual disciplines. Maybe as I spoke then, you, you kind of really got a sense, maybe I need to shake some things up. The way I've been living has been comfortable. It's been nice. I, I'm enjoying life. Life's happy, but actually, maybe it's just a little bit too easy. Maybe, maybe God wants to give you a bit of a holy shake this morning to shake some things up. But I wonder for some of us, maybe it's time to put the bottle down. And I want to say, actually, for, for all clarity's sake, this is, this is something, this isn't completely my idea. I got this idea, Francis Chan did something similar, so I'm not going to kind of claim something for myself that's not mine, but I thought it was good. So, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? So it's not mine. But, but maybe it's time to put the bottle down. Maybe actually we've been coming to other people expecting them to feed us. Maybe it's time to take some responsibility ourselves. Maybe when we come to other people to feed us, where, you know, when a baby comes to their parents to feed them, they've got no, no control over what they're fed, whether it's right or wrong. It, it says in the passage here that as we grow in maturity, we, we grow to understand what's good and what's wrong. Maybe we need to learn to feed ourselves and to discover what's good and, and what's wrong. Maybe it's time to put the bottle down. And so... And actually, maybe as well, you've been obsessed with the spiritual disciplines. And it's great, you've grown in God in them. But maybe there's some really glaring attitudes that God needs to challenge in you. Maybe there's some, there's some ways you think about other people that God needs to challenge. Maybe even as you come to church, I'm going to say, maybe this is even slightly linked into last week. Maybe when you come to church and you only speak to people that look like you because it's easy, maybe you need to try and push out your comfort zone a little bit. Maybe that's what you need to do to take a step. And so I, and I want to join you. I'm, I'm not gonna, we're not actually going to play any pads or anything like that because I think sometimes we can have all the things to try and help us have a moment, help us, help us feel good. But actually, I think this is a moment right now maybe for some of you to take some responsibility of your spiritual growth. Maybe it's a, Roman, a moment right now to make a decision that something's going to change from this moment forward. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer from, from Psalm 139. I'm going to read it through a couple of times, and then we're going to pray it in ourselves. And so it says this, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's just ponder that a second. I'm going to read it again. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. One more time. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Why don't you begin just to pray that in your own heart right now? Ask God to search you. Ask him to reveal the things in you that are offensive to him. Oh, you might not like what he says. <laughs> ask him where he wants you to grow. Just begin just to ask him that yourself. Maybe right now he's going he's to reveal something that you need to do as you leave this place. Maybe there's some practical things you need to put in, in place. Maybe there's some people you need to apologize to. God, would you search our hearts? Jesus, would you, would you, I give you permission right now, would you just examine every single part of me? The darkest secrets, the habits, the, the, the ways I treat other people, whether I know them or whether I don't know them, Jesus, would you reveal them to me? 
Oh, Jesus, would you show me the ways in, in my heart, the attitudes that I have, the things that I live out in practice that aren't healthy, the things that aren't in line with what you have for me. Jesus, would you show them to me? Jesus, I'm, I'm, I know that you hold me, that you help me grow. It's your spirit that helps me grow. But Jesus, would you, would you help me by just revealing those things in my life, Jesus? I want to be an open book to you. I know you see everything anyway, but Jesus, I say that I'm an open book. Would you help me to grow more like you? So once more, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus. We're just going to ponder here for a second one more. I feel like there's some people God's beginning to speak. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come move. I wonder actually as, as, as we're praying now, maybe there's a, there's a, a few people here who kind of um, felt that challenge that they need to shake some things up. Actually, maybe they, they can't just make some little changes. They need to make a bit of a radical change. They need to shake something up. And I wonder, there's, there's nothing super spiritual about this. I'm not even going to ask people to, around you to pray with you. Unless you'd like that, then, then kind of invite someone next to you to pray for you. But sometimes I think there's a step in acknowledging that God's saying something. So if that's you, if you felt that God's kind of saying, I need to shake something up, I wonder, would you just kind of pop your hand in the air? I'm going to pray for you. Okay, we've got, we got a few. Awesome. Amazing. So you know, this is, this is like a moment now between you and God. You know that he's saying, I need to change something up. So Jesus, I thank you for those people that have acknowledged that you're saying to them, it's time to shake something up. And oh, Father, I pray, would you help them have the courage to do that when they leave this place? Father, right now, we just pray your blessing over them. We pray your empowering by your Holy Spirit over them right now. Jesus, would you give them the courage to change things that need to change? in pursuit of you. And Jesus, I thank you for their, their, this moment of surrender to you, this moment of, of, of kind of following you, Jesus. Would you help them to make those changes? Would you help them to, to take that, to shape those things up, to come and follow you? Thank you, Jesus. And I wonder, would you stand to your feet together? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sing together. We're going to worship Jesus. But I encourage you, if you're still in the moment, if you're still kind of engaging with Jesus, if you're still revealing and searching things, then please stay seated, stay, and, and we're going to leave this space open to respond how we'd like to respond. Thank you, team.